stocking feet and pulls 500 tons with a full train. It was worth waiting for. The Duchess lives at York in the National Railway Museum, but she sallies forth regularly to haul special trains over long distances. And for this, she has to be prepared and fired up the day before by Pete the fireman and Kim the engineer prepared with extra care if you're climbing the Settle Carlisle line. I spent five years of my youth sitting beside a railway line collecting train numbers, hardly ever going home. It's what they call a misspent youth. I shouldn't have been collecting numbers. I should have been finding out how engines actually work. Well, it's never too late to learn. First thing we do is make sure that the the boiler has actually got water in it. You'll know, you, you do quite yeah. a lot of damage if, <laughs> if they hadn't. Well, I think it's about time we lit it now. The boiler is all right. Got plenty of water in. We'll get right. the cleaner up to light it. Right. right. They're quite fussy about the kind of coal they use. Welsh coal's not bad, but Yorkshire's good, and Nottinghamshire is quite good too. During the miners' strike, they found themselves using Polish coal. They didn't like it much. How long does the coal take to light? Does it, does it take fire immediately? Three or four minutes. It's better than my fire. <laughs> We've previously coaled the fire box. Yeah. Fill the fire box full of coal first. You've got all the coal you need? Nearly all You don't start off with a little bit and then build up? No, no. About six inch cover. What's the fullest it ever gets? Is that about it? No, when the engine's working you can have probably about three quarters of a ton in there. It takes about six hours to get the boiler into steam from coal. So, really, Kim, we're, we're sitting under a huge boiler which is mounted on huge wheels. What I want to know is how does the steam get to the wheel? Well, the boiler, which is all that red mass, it's full of water. And at the top, there's what we call the dome. And in there, there's the regulator valve or throttle valve. Steam then comes from that regulator valve mm -hmm. through into the, the smoke box, which is this black mass at the front here. And it's then what we call superheated, which is uh, the steam is then taken in tubes back through the fire tubes and heated even more to a higher temperature. This, this engine, when that's working hard, can get up to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yeah. And then it came from the superheater and it comes down to the, the cylinders. And this particular locomotive's got four cylinders. There's uh, one on either side and, and two, two, hidden. two hidden between the frames. And, uh, this, this part here is the valve that uh, lets the steam be admitted to one or the other side of the piston. Mm. Because th this, is, this is a double acting engine, not like a car engine, that's double acting. The piston is actually pulled and pushed and this valve up here controls which side of the piston that that steam is so going all, to all the power is in there the power is all in the cylinders yes and just that That's little cylinder pushes this thing well this and three other cylinders yeah. here it's then transmitted through this crosshead because that piston wouldn't be strong it would bend if it hadn't got support from these bars and then down to the connecting rod into a rotary motion down onto the crank, which is incorporated in the wheel. This is one that's actually driven by the uh, cylinders. The other one is the leading one. And that's one driven the by the inside cylinders? That's driven by the inside cylinders. See, and that's connected along? And that's connected by a side rod, which connects all six driving wheels together so that you've got better heat. And it really makes a difference? That makes a lot of difference. Yeah. If you had a single wheel, you wouldn't get half the before the war, the London Midland Scottish Railway was lagging badly behind the other lines. There was nothing nearly as powerful on their express routes as the Great Western Kings, so they tempted William Stanier, the wizard designer of the Great Western, to come over to them 
and create something fast and sleek. By 1938, he had come up with the goods, the princess and duchess classes. And it was in that year that the Duchess of Hamilton was born at Crewe. All manner of smaller parts are made in the smithy. Nuts and bolts in all sizes and varieties, rivets for the tens of thousands. This is where the mysteries go in. A modern engine, such as 6207, has a big appetite for steam. Hence her large great area of 45 square feet and her high amount of tubing. First to go in is the main steam pipe, through the center of which will later go the rod connecting the regulator handle to the valve. Meanwhile, things have been happening at the other end of the boiler, and some familiar objects have been finding their way onto the fire door plate. One of the most amazing sights is the way heavy loads, and mostly awkward and cumbersome ones, are slung about in the work. A screech from the overhead crane, grappling hooks descending out of the air en route, and almost before you can say knife, a load of from 50 tons up to a complete engine is whisked away to a new position. She's off. A thousand men have served her in the making. How many thousands will she serve? during her life on the LMS main line. Is this what they call the Pacific class? That's right, yeah. And that's something to do with the wheel, isn't it? Um, yeah, so you've got four carrying wheels at the front, then your big six driving wheels, and then two little carrying wheels. So it's not a Duchess class, or it is a Duchess class as well? Well, the proper term for them, the LMS call them Princess Coronations. What do you call them? Duchesses. <laughs> <laughs> and did it look like this when it was first built? Oh, no, no. It had a streamlined case on it. What, what did they do then? It helped to cut the wind resistance down, so was, in theory you burnt less coal. They seem to have gone through a fashion with streamlining then, do you think? And then they stopped doing it, so it couldn't, it couldn't be that effective. Well, it was very difficult to keep the engine in good maintenance when you've got to get behind the uh, casing every time to do the daily jobs. Just before the war, there really was a mania for speed, for being the fastest steam engine on Earth, or for winning the transatlantic blue ribbon, and things were made to look that way as well with the streamlining stripes even going down the carriages. Maybe it somehow helped to counteract the depression of the 1930s. Oddly enough, the streamlined look is back with us again today on British Rail's intercity trains. No sooner was a Duchess built than she was sent to America to appear at the New York World's Fair. The Americans had heard all about the crack express from London to Scotland, the Coronation Scot, and the Coronation engine was what they wanted. What they got was a Duchess. They changed the name plates and the number. Isn't that what we call cheating? Well, yes, but that was done quite a bit with the uh, locos. To meet, uh, well, American regulations, uh, that had to be fitted with a headlight, plus they put a bell on it. Was that just for fun, or you don't no, have to No, 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 yes, that was their regulation. Really? Yeah. Shipping the Coronation Scott engine at Southampton is quite a job, for it weighs a hundred tonnes. Driver Bishop and Farman Carswell are there to see it put aboard. As the locomotive is lifted from the quayside by the ship's derrick, the vessel takes a heavy list, but rights herself again as it's swung over the hull. The ship that takes it across, by the way, is Norwegian. The train is going to America to tour the country and to be on show at the World's Fair. 